All right, this is Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. You know the drill. Hashtag right there, get involved in the comments, send us your questions, and we'll answer them. First question this week is from Mick the Shaggy. All right, Mick? Hi, Doddy. Recently, I started to hear strange clicking sounds during hard braking on both front and rear brakes. I've checked the bolts of the rotors and calipers, and they're all okay. I suspect these sounds come from the spokes, which uh, where one spoke is contacting another. Could that be the case? And does it mean the spokes are stretched and need some tightening? Before these sound effects did not occur. Um, okay, that's interesting. So, yeah, okay, well, I don't need to read the rest of the question, there's a lot in there. Okay, so I have had this a number of times. Let me get a lightweight wheel. Let's get this one, because this is a special light. So this is a super light cross-country wheel. It's got 28 spokes. And if I twist these, you can just, did you hear that? So that is spokes rubbing together. Now, that's not a problem, because this is a super lightweight wheel. Now, you need to sacrifice certain things to get a super lightweight wheel. One of them is the amount of spokes. So 28 spokes on it. Actually, or is it 24? I forget. Whatever. The fact is, it's super light, and the wheel flexes slightly. But it's good flex. Now, some people get obsessed with having stiff wheels, yeah? You do need stiffness, but you do need an element of flex. Otherwise, you won't be able to hold onto your handlebars. There'll be too much shock transmitted through them. They need to have a little bit of compliance. Now, your spokes actually do move around quite a lot more than you might, might think. And yeah, it can be highlighted by brakes. It can be highlighted when you're really aggressively pushing a bike into terrain. Now, you hear of this on the front end a bit more than you do on the rear. So. The fact that yours is making clicking noises, I think, have a look at your brake pads first. Now, depending on which pads you have in there, sometimes the pads can move within the actual caliper. Now, I know the Shimano XT ones, the finned pads with the vents on the, on the top there, like the heat fins, they can actually vibrate and rattle, which can drive people mad, but it doesn't always happen. It's pretty inconsistent between brakes. You either get a set to do it or you get a set that don't. Now, that can be a source of clicking under braking as they just move around slightly there with the vibration there. But it's nothing to do with your rotors, like I said, nothing to do with the actual calipers because the bolts I would check there. So check your brake pads in there. But if you do think it is the wheels, then you've got a few things there. So check, check for um, spoke tension. Work your way around from the valve there all the way around the wheel itself. And basically just see that they feel roughly the same. Now, if you think they feel especially soft, and you've never trued a wheel before, this is a point I would take it to a mechanic and get them to check it, because this is something you need to feel. Now, some manufacturers will recommend having your spokes at a certain tension, and there is a tool that you can actually measure your spoke tension with, but a lot of mechanics actually go by feel. Now, when I've built wheels in the past, I've always gone by feel. I've always built wheels for myself. It's not been a commercial thing, so I've never felt the need to. And I've kind of got a good handle on it. But something I've found over the years that helps is a bit of wax between the spokes. Because some spokes do naturally contact, others don't touch at all. It depends on the style wheel you have, the amount of flex it has, and the type of spokes you have as well. Because you get a single uh, straight gauge, you get double butted and triple butted. You get exceptionally lightweight spokes and you get really big burly spokes. The light ones are going to flex a bit more and rub together. Want to rub together, you do get a bit more noise like that. So, a uh, tiny bit of wax between them, big hand of wax is good. You don't want to use lube or grease or copper slip or anything like that because uh, it could end up elsewhere near your brakes. But a little bit of candle wax just on the spoke itself, I found has worked for me in the past. Uh, give that a try. Um, but failing that, get your wheels trued up, get them tensioned, and that might make the difference for you. So, hopefully, that works for you. Okay. Um, next up is from. J Jacob 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 R A O two, um, if that's written right. If I have two piston Shimano brakes, can I just upgrade the caliper to four piston, or do I need a new four port lever? Uh, no, the levers are essentially the same. I've done exactly that on my reactor. It came with uh, two piston brakes, front and rear, and I got a four piston caliper and put it on the front one. There were the same levers. It works brilliantly. I just needed a little bit more power on the front. Heavy, basically. I uh, didn't think I needed it on the back because it's quite a big rotor. Uh, well, 180 is not massive, but the bike's light enough that it's super easy to lock it up. And let's face it, I'm not going to be doing any 45 minute alpine descents on a bike like that when I've got other bikes here that I'd rather take for that sort of riding. So I uh, just stuck with the two piston on the rear. 
Now the best way to do this is stick within the same realm brake. So if you've got a Deal or an SLX caliper, um, stick with the same, just get the four part option on there and it will work fine. Now you can mix and match between them, but they don't all work because some of them have different hose fittings. Some go in directly, some use the banjo system. So if you can, if you've got a set of SLX brakes, for example, get the four piston SLX and you know it's gonna work straight on there. Of course, you'll need to have a full system bleed on there, so uh, do it properly, take the pads out, use a pad spacer, fresh oil all the way. Don't be tempted to use what's in there, just flush it through, and uh, you'll know it's gonna perform like a brand new brake. It's quite cool, and in fact, that's probably a good idea for a video, actually replacing a brake caliper, because it's basically the same as replacing a brake lever, um, or maybe I should just call it replacing a brake hose. Let's <laughs> do that one, shall we? Uh, good stuff. And good luck with that. Just if, if you're unsure, double check with the bike shop that you're buying the specific caliper from because they can obviously see your brake lever, whichever one it is in there. Um, you say Shimano two piston brakes, but you haven't said which model. Some of the cheaper ones, you're a bit more limited, but uh, most of them, you can mix and match between them all. Okay, Diver Rob, can you use duct tape as tubeless tape? Yeah, uh, well, technically, anything that seals the rim bed, any sort of tape you could use. However, some tapes are porous, so after a while, you could argue, I mean, the, the sealing nature of the sealant you put in there will do a job. However, the tape itself might perish. Uh, and obviously some, some tapes aren't gonna handle the sealant too well because that can perish. So essentially the best option is always gonna be a specific tubeless tape. But I said recently I've used Gorilla Tape on loads of rims in the past, and it's been fine. And someone actually commented in, well, in the comments, <laughs> funnily enough, they said, oh, no, it's porous, you can't do that. Well, I can, I did, and I have, and it works. And Envy supply their rims with, um, or they did supply their rims with Gorilla Tape. It does work. Okay, so at the end of the day, though, if you want something you know 100% is going to be like the water type solution, get the proper stuff because you can't beat the proper thing for the job. And this applies to anything, the proper tool for the job, the proper bike for the job, whatever it is. You know, everything else is compromised, but uh, hey, nothing wrong with the compromise. Okay, Jace Phillips. Hey guys, I just wanted to know what the difference is between a reverse arch fork, something like the Manitou, uh, so that would be the Manitou Mesa, or a traditional arch that you would see on something as a Fox 38 or a RockShox 7. Okay, right, let me get this down. So I've got Fox 36 here. Right, so what Jace is talking about is this is what we would say is a regular arch. So it's on the front of the fork, but on the Manatee forks, it's on the rear. So that would look like the front of the fork. Now you might wonder why they did that. Now, the thing is with having a an arch on the front, essentially, you have to overbuild it to make it really stiff. Now this isn't a problem. It's part of the fork design, it suits it. It's the right shape, it's the right size, and there's gonna be no issues with clearance. Now think how much this moves. So part of the design of this, this brace here, so on the older Fox braces, they were a bit more angular. They've gone for a rounder design and it actually sits forwards a bit more. Now because we're changing the offset, on the crowns, basically, you're getting issues with clearances of the brace under full compression. So you think you're gonna get almost all full compression here from seal to the top of the fork. And in doing that, you wanna make sure that this part doesn't contact the head tube of the bike. Of course, some head tubes on carbon bikes, for example, are getting quite big now. So this will clear it, no problem. But you could argue with the reverse arch, you've got limited options because of the fact it's at the back, you're gonna have a down tube here. Okay, so, all right, most bikes will be absolutely fine, but you're gonna get some anomalies out there with bizarre shaped down tubes. You could have clearance issues. So I guess that could be a pro and a con. Um, on the front, mud guards fit fine. You can get direct guards to fit these. I think Fox might do their own one. There's various others out there. They're in the right place, essentially. They look good, don't they? They look great. Okay, for the rear though, now the cool thing about putting a brace on the rear, well, you could say it looks cool because it's different, or you could say it looks horrible because it's different. I really like the look of a reverse arch. I don't have an issue with it. I actually like how clean the bike looks in the front, just something a bit different. Don't be tempted to flip your own fork around because it won't work with the offset and you might hit this basically, so don't do that. It's all gonna be messed up. Run it the correct way around. But the cool thing about running an arch on the rear is for the same amount of material, it will be stiffer or you can have less material, i.e. it's gonna be lighter, and it will be as stiff as an arch on the front. Okay, so although I've got a 36 in my hand, I'm gonna use the Fox 38 as an example here because the Meza is available with travel up to 180, just like the 38. The Fox 38 has 38 millimeter stanchions. It's a really big, beefy fork. The Meza, though, has 37 mil stanchions and it's lighter. 
and I can make it lighter because of the reverse arch on the back because of the fact they're losing weight by having a thinner fork but they're keeping it as stiff well they claim as stiff as the 38 or other similar forks yet they've got a lighter equivalent fork and then of course there's the axle system so Fox uses a regular round axle so does RockShox whereas on the Manitou they have a hexagonal fit axle which is more points of contact so it can add more stiffness into it so it's just a different approach and Manitou have had this for many years and in fact Pace used to have it on the British design and when DT Swiss actually licensed or bought the uh, Pace, Pace fork range essentially they had the the brace on the rear as well but now they have the brace on the front of their forks i'm not sure why they changed but they changed because they redeveloped the forks i guess maybe changing identity um but essentially if you're buying manitou meza or you're buying a pike or a fox 36 or whatever you're buying a good fork so don't worry about it for the record i'd love a set of manitou mezzas i think it's a beautiful looking fork the features they've got in there like the infinite rate tune the triple air spring like it's got loads of cool stuff going on uh, so don't be put off by the looks if it's something that worries you it's a brilliant fork all right next up is daniel Vasquez. Dottie, i've got a race face ride crank set with 175 with a bolt very stubborn or okay i know where this is going um, i've tried with an eight mil allen wrench what are the options for me um, okay, you need a persuader. What is a persuader, I hear you ask? Basically a big metal bar. So a lot of riders will keep an old handlebar, basically an old steerer tube, any old bit of metal bar, and you see mechanics using this in workshops as an extension. Basically so you can get a bit more leverage to really like give it some welly. Now you've got to make sure though, when you do this, there's no chance of the Allen key slipping because not only can it damage the bolt head, you, you know you don't want it to slip and ruin that because you're gonna have to drill it out and then go down that whole route which can get really messy especially with something that's got as much torque in it as that um the other reason i nearly popped a rib a few years back when doing just that when basically a bolt had corroded into a friend's bike and i basically put all my weight on it and it slipped and basically the end of the saddle just dug into my rib and it actually like stopped me riding for a few weeks it really really hurt i was pretty close to breaking a rib so just take care when you do this but uh, yeah you need a persuader mate uh, you'd be surprised with simple leverage what you can do now you might need help because there's a crank bolt as you're undoing it you need to hold the other crank yeah so that's when the hazards can can come about so if you can get someone else to hold the other rib uh, the other rib <laughs> if you get someone else to hold the other crank and you can use the persuader then happy days uh, just make sure that allen key doesn't slip if you're in any doubt at all you could go down a sacrificial allen key route and bond it in and get yourself a new allen key and a new bolt but that is like last chance uh, one other thing you could do if it's really not giving get some three in one oil or some other kind of penetrating oil lay the bike over on the side basically soak that area leave it overnight try again the next day um, rinse and repeat basically hopefully you'll get that out good luck okay next question should the factory grease stroke oil on a chain be removed before the first ride like this one comes up loads but i'm just going to keep reading this um, i understand that the chain needs to be lubricated but don't they overdo it uh, i recently deep cleaned and degreased my drivetrain and swapped my my chain kmc and went for a short ride in normal conditions a bit damp no mud no dust and the amount of grime and dirt that collected on the chain cassette jockey wheels within the hour is incredible never seen anything like this okay right so there's various schools of thought on this okay from both the manufacturer and from the people that do this so the grease you can feel on a chain basically that comes on it is essentially packing grease so some people are insistent of degreasing it the second they buy it but i wouldn't do that now if that packing grease on there is going to affect you with your local conditions if it's dusty then yeah you can wipe it off but the best thing to do that is wipe it off with some lube just wipe, wipe it off and then put it put it on your bike and ride it yeah i would not bother degreasing a brand new chain because it's grease that's in there you're going to naturally wear it in time why why get rid of it and replace it with oil when it's already in there and some brands like kmc they're actually they actively tell you to never degrease their chains and never submerge it in degreaser because they say the grease that they put in when they make the chain at the factories you could never get it back in place and the chain will also always wear out faster when that grease has gone from inside the rollers where the pins and the roller, basically the roller goes around the pin so a few schools of thought there now some people hate the stuff and they want to degrease it the second they get it and put it on a bike i think that's a waste 
but yes, the packing grease that's on it to basically make sure they don't corrode, uh, you know, some of them could be in storage or in a container ship or whatever for, for some time. You wanna make sure a steel chain basically isn't gonna corrode. So the packing grease goes on there. So yes, you could wipe that off, but I wouldn't degrease the actual chain. And obviously use your lube of choice as well. So if you're getting loads of stuff sticking to it, are you using the correct lube? There's loads of options. Got wet lubes, you've got dry, in fact, I've only got wet lubes out here at the moment because we're in the middle of winter, but uh, you get wet lubes and you get dry lubes. Okay, so if you're unclear about this, for anyone, we've done this a lot of times, but there's gonna be loads of people that don't know. Dry lubes and wet lubes, they're both liquids, so they're technically both wet. But the difference is a wet lube is much thicker. It's like a real thick, gungy liquid, and it's very, um, it's very water repellent. It's designed to stay in place. So that's amazing, but if you use it in summer conditions, you're gonna just get dust and everything is gonna stick to it. So the opposite can be said of dry lube. So yes, it's still liquid, but you pour it on onto your chain and that liquid will evaporate. So the liquid part of it is a solvent. It's designed to get the lubricating particles into the pins and rollers of the chain to deliver that stuff to where it needs to go. Then it evaporates, leaving your chain feeling much drier to the touch and less likely to get stuff sticking to it. Now, why might, might you not use that all, all year round? Well, it's not very water repellent. Basically, it washes out quite easily. So you have to kind of pick the right one for you. Now, actually, I'm a bit of a fan of dry lube all year round. I'll say that with only wet lubes behind me at the moment, but honestly, I tend to run dry lubes most of the time. Like recently, it has been exceptionally bad, so I am using a wet lube, but um, a lot of the time, I'll stick to dry and just keep applying more. Now, next up is from Nuff. Doddy, on mountain bikes, why is there more overdrive gears than underdrive gears? Uh, when riding, most of the time is spent climbing in one form or another, and yet on modern mountain bikes with a 32 chaining and 12 speeds, you've got four underdrive gears and eight overdrive gears. Why is that? Even on my old school 90s mountain bike, I've got four, all right, okay. Right, so you've got overdrive, which is faster rotations of the output axle than the input. Yeah, so you're pedaling like this and the output axle spin around, and you get the opposite with underdrive. Now, on a mountain bike, when you need those low gears, you're basically climbing something very, very steep. Okay, so there's bigger jumps between those gears and there's a high torque application. Right? You just simply don't need as many of them because of the fact that there's a limit to how steep you can actually climb on a mountain bike. Whereas anyone, if you're extremely fit, you can be powering for a bigger gear and all of those bigger gears, there's less of a jump between them because you want your cadence to be a bit more refined. When you're really like winching in those low gears, basically you just don't need as many of them. Um, that said, what are we on now? 52 as the biggest. What's to say it's not gonna get bigger again? Um, but that's really it. Do you need any more low gears? If you do, you can go down more at the front. But the whole point of the 12 speed is you've got what, four or five overdrives and then the rest of underdrives. So, yeah, no, that's it. So yeah, typically we're winching in the lower gears, so uh, you're really there. It's like all hands on deck to get you up to the top of the hill. And of course, there's gonna be a point where you can't actually climb up that thing anymore. Whereas it's much more important to have more gears that are uh, more usable for more terrain. So you'd even find like even on intermediate climbs, you won't be using those super low gears. So, and a really fit rider will be using even more down the block. And of course, having a transition between the gears is a nice thing. That's why our road friends run close ratio blocks just so you can keep a track on your cadence there. Uh, next up is from Barry Wallstead. So my wife just got, I just got my wife bike and it came with a, a Dior transmission. It says the cassette has a Hyperglide Plus, but it came with a non Shimano chain. Do I need to put a Shimano Hyperglide Plus chain on there for her to experience full quality shifting? And if so, why would a non Shimano chain be spec'd from the factory? Her bike is a Polygon Siskiyou T7. Uh, well, technically, yeah, you want to stay within the same transmission series to get all of the optimized points. And you're quite right with Shimano, you need the Hyperglide Plus chain, sorry, yeah, the Hyperglide Plus chain, which has a dynamic chainring engagement plus system on there. So yes, that will work better, but it will work absolutely fine with another compatible 12-speed chain. So unless it's causing you any problems or you feel like you're missing out, don't bother changing it, um, just wear it out. You're going to replace it at some point, it's a consumable part. We always talk about this on GMB and Tech. You don't need to just throw money at these sort of things. Just get out there. It's one of the first things that's going to wear out. It's your chain and cassette and naturally wear. You're spending money literally the entire time you're pedaling those things around. So don't worry about that too much. Um, it's all a compromise. So you think if you're a bike manufacturer, you could cost, 
save some costing basically by fitting a, a different brand chain, a different brand crank set, for example, rather than Shimano. And you could put that money into something else on a bike, like perhaps a better shock absorber. Rather than having a base model, you could have a mid model. Yeah, I know what I'd rather have. I'd rather have the better shock and a cheaper chain, uh, chain and crank on the bike. Um, it's all about compromise. You're not getting ripped off if that's what you're thinking. You know, all manufacturers do this. Uh, a great example is you'll see an XT derailleur on the bike and think, oh, that bike's got XT gears on it. But it will often have SLX cassette, SLX chain, you know, and cheaper componentry elsewhere. It's to make you look at that bike and want to purchase it. But, you know, they're not sort of underselling you or misselling you. They're just saving you money where you don't need to spend that money. Um, that Polygon bike, the Cisco T7, is a great bike, by the way. I made a video, I don't know if you saw it, I think it was um, probably summer last year. I kind of lose track with all the lockdown stuff. Um, I had to do an unboxing with it, and actually I was really impressed with it. The geometry, the finish, really good componentry on it, it's pretty light. Like, I thought it was a decent bike. I'd actually say Polygon are a brand to watch out for. I'd definitely be watching this space. So uh, no, don't worry about it, it's all good. And there we go, that's the end of uh, this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you for all the great questions. Keep them coming. See you soon. Ta-ra.